Okay, so now we see there's this uh, person named Haman, who is an Agagite. Does anybody know what an Agagite is? Uh, well, I'll give you a hint. Uh, Agagite means he descended from Agag, or Agag. Does anybody know who that is? No? Well, let's, let's do a little back up, because I want to show you there's, no, there's nothing in here without purpose. Uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15 real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to see that Saul makes a mistake, mistake, okay? We're going to see that Saul blows it. Um, so we're in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Um, Samuel is speaking to Saul. Uh, verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now, this takes us back another step. When God delivered the Jews out of Egypt, he brought them via the long road to Israel. He didn't take the, the coast road, which would have gotten them there in a couple days. He took them down through the Sinai Peninsula and up through the wilderness, okay? He did that for a number of reasons. First and foremost, I think he did that to build them as a people of their own identity. So they didn't leave as slave of the Jews and rush headlong and become slaves of the Canaanites, okay? Because they had not yet really established an identity for themselves, okay? That's one of the reasons I think that happened. But as they're moving up toward the Promised Land, they get attacked by the Amalekites. It's unprovoked. They're not invading the Amalekites' land. The, the Amalekites just assault them. Now, if you remember the story, uh, on the day of the battle, Moses went and he stood on a hill overlooking the battle, and as long as he kept his hands raised, the Israelites would win. But when he dropped his hands, the Amalekites would win. And so there were two men that came, and they lifted up Moses' hands, and he kept them up till sunset, and Israel finally had the victory. But at the end of that battle, God says something uh, kind of interesting. He says that, I will blot out even the remembrance of the name of Amalek from under heaven. Okay. You know you've got a really messed up bad when God is that angry at you. Okay, so jump ahead. 400 plus years later, Israel has come in. They've gone through the judges. They now have Saul as king. And, and so Samuel is speaking to him. Uh, God says he remembers. He saw this and he remembers. And he says, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, child, infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. You think God was ticked? Yeah. Well then, if you remember the story, what happens? Saul goes out and they, they keep the best. And Samuel comes back and, and uh, he says... Did you do what God commanded? Oh, yeah, we did what God commanded. Why, why do I hear sheep? Oh, we took some of that to give offerings to God. And that's where we get the famous line, God desires obedience rather than sacrifice. Okay? And, and then um, the king, let's, let's uh, look here real quick. Um, 32, verse 32 uh, then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Okay, so here's the dynamic. You have Saul who was given a commission of God to carry out God's will and God's wrath on the people of, of uh, Amalek. You have the Amalekite king, whose name is Agag. Okay? And Saul spares Agag, and then Samuel ultimately kills him. Now fast forward a number of years, and we get to the exile. And in the exile, we have two characters that are connected genetically to Saul, being Mordecai, 
It's one of the sons of Kish in, in his lineage. And then you have Haman, who is related to Agag, the king of the Amalekites. God never leaves anything undone. God doesn't do things by half measures. When he does things, he carries it through to completion. Okay? So we see these people. Vashti's out of the picture. Now we have <coughs> Esther has come in. She's the new queen. Her cousin Haman discovers the plot uh, against the king. And then Haman is raised to be second in the kingdom. And we know that he is a, an Amalekite and he's related to Agag. Okay, do you see the connection here? Do you see how God's bringing this all back together again? When you've read this before, you probably had no understanding as to the historical significance and, and, and God's purpose beyond saving the Jews. God was doing more than just saving the Jews. He was bringing to fulfillment something that he had prophesied almost 800 years before. Okay, so um, Haman is resurrected to second in the kingdom. Everybody bows to Haman except Mordecai, not Mordecai, and Haman hates him for it, okay? Um, Haman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, has no clue that Esther is a Jew, and he decides he is going to wipe out all Jews in the empire. Now he goes to the king, we don't understand what was going on in King Ahasuerus' brain, we don't understand how connected he was with what was going on in, in his kingdom, uh, especially as relates to the Jews. But, but for whatever reason, King Haman comes and he gets, spins this tale about these backwards people that are evil and, and they're a, a thorn in the side of, of the kingdom and it would be better if we just got rid of them all. And, and King Ahasuerus goes, well, okay, let's do it. And so he has a, a decree written. Now in the Persian and the Median culture, when the king made a law, you could not rescind that law. That made you think twice about putting a law in place because you had to think through all of the ramifications, not just in the moment, but down the road. And so he uh, tells Hadad, or, uh, Haman, write it out, and he writes out this thing, and he, he's trying to figure out, well, when should we do this? And he casts lots. Now, we know that the lots that they were cast were called per or poor, okay? And of those lots... He, somehow or another, I'm guessing that there was some kind of connection to astrology because somehow or another he came up with a specific date. Um, does anybody remember the date offhand? What's that? One of the days in the month of Adar. The 13th of the 12th month, which is Adar. Okay? And so they sent out this decree that on the 13th of Adar, by the casting of the poor, all of the people in the empire could wipe out all the Jews and take their stuff. Okay? Wow. Do you think God knew what he was doing when he started out to eradicate Amalek from the face of the earth? Mm -hmm. um, so, Haman, thinking he's hot stuff, he's going to get his way, um, Mordecai hears about it, and, and he comes to the gate, he's wearing uh, sackcloth, and he's got ashes, and, and Esther hears what's going on. So she sends out a suit of clothes for him, man, dress properly. What are you doing? And then we have this, this dialogue back and forth, and keep in mind they were not talking face to face, they were talking through a personal servant of Esther's. And he says, have you not heard what's happened? We're, we're dead. Unless you go and talk to the king, we're dead. Now, one of the rules in the, the kingdom of Persia was that you could not come uninvited into the king's presence. Okay? There were actual, there was a, a series of bodyguards that had a particular name. It's in Persian. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, but their job, they had axes. And their job was, if somebody came into the presence of the king, um, and the king did not extend the scepter to him, their job was to behead them there on the spot in that moment. Okay, so this was a serious thing to come before the king. And Mordecai says, you've got to go to the king. She said, I haven't been invited. He says, well, you think that you are going to escape this judgment? He says, you know, hey, if, if you don't do it, God's going to raise up deliverance for Israel from someone. But you and your family are going to suffer for it. And so she, does, she says, uh, all right, we'll go to the elders and tell them to fast for three days. Okay. Now, um, they fast on the third day. She goes uninvited. 
to the presence of the king. And sitting to the king's side is Haman, and she comes in, and, and he extends the scepter. Uh, she obviously found favor with the king, and, and the king invites her in, and she, he says, what would you like, what are you asking me? She says, I, I want to invite you and Haman to dinner. Now, i, I got to tell you, guys, I don't understand the devious mind of women. Because if that had been me, I would have gone in and said, hey, do you know what this fool's doing? We're getting whacked, and, and you let it because of him. She doesn't do that. She invites him to supper. I don't get it. Okay. So the next day, they come for supper. And, and she asks the king again. She, says, she said, I, I would ask one more thing of you. And he says, what do you want? Name it. She said, I want, I, I want you two to come back for supper tomorrow. I guess her, her thought is, man, either I'm going out having blessed this man with food, or he's going out with a full stomach. Because <laughs> I, I don't understand why she did what she did, but she, this is how she did it. And so Haman goes home, and he's all, all pumped, and he's stoked, and he thinks life is good, and, and, but he sees Mordecai, and he goes home, and now, and now he's, oh, he's got the saggy boobs. And his, his family's like, well, what's wrong with you? I said, this Mordecai, you know, what this, this guy, man, he just, everybody else gets it. He doesn't get it. Well, you know what? You're second in the kingdom. Kill him. You know what? Go, go put the gallows up, and let's do this right now. To cheer you up, let's put the gallows up. They put up, like, almost 75 feet high gallows, okay? And, and I, I don't know why, but that perks him up. Well, that night, the king's laying in bed, and he's restless, and he can't sleep. So he calls to the chroniclers, and they come, and they start reading to him, and he, he remembers the story. Here's the story of Mordecai, giving the, the thing to, to protect him, giving word to protect him. And he says, well, what was done for Mordecai? And they're like, nothing. And I believe absolutely that God would not let him sleep that night, and God prompted that because God's deliverance came through this. So first, he, he, when Haman comes in the next morning, he, the dude's stoked. Man, the day's coming up. We're going to wipe out all the Jews. I'm going to have a hanging party, and Mordecai's invited. And he's, he's thinking everything's cool. I, I get to go. I'm going to hang Mordecai. I get to have dinner with the king and his queen. Life is good. And the king says, you know, what would you do if you were in my shoes to honor someone that has done great deeds for the kingdom? What would you do? Now, Haman, man, his head is just swelling. Man, you know, if you really wanted to honor someone like me, um, what you would do is you would take a horse that you had ridden and, and some robes that you had worn, and you would dress him in the robes and put him on the horse, and then you'd have somebody lead the horse through the city and declaring that the dust will be done for those that, that serve the king, and, and this man is honored by the king, and, and declaring it before all people. And, and Ahasuerus goes, brilliant! This is what I want you to do. Go get the robes, go get the horse, Put him on Mordecai, put Mordecai on the horse, and then you lead it. Uh-oh. So he goes, and he does, and then he goes home, and he's bitter. And, and then his family, you've got to love families that are like this. You know, last night they're like, hey, man, raise the, the, the gallows. We're going to hang him. And they come back, and they say what Mordecai's doing. They say, dude, you are in, you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> Things are not going to go well for you. Boy, you messed up. Well, that night he goes to dinner, and Esther lays out the plan, what he's planning on doing, and, and how he's going to kill her, or kill her and the people, and, and, and the king gets mad. He gets up and he storms out. Haman throws himself on the bed and is pleading with her to intervene on the, the king's behalf to save him. Well, the king comes back in, and all he sees is Haman on the bed groping Esther. Now, things just went from really bad to really worse. <laughs> okay, this guy, okay, so Haman ends up giving up his life. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, servants there says, hey, uh, you know, do what you will, but I, he's got this brand new gallows at his place, and it's 75, it's un untested, <laughs> unused, brand new. See if it fits, you know. And they send him off, and, and he gets hung. Now then, Esther and Mordecai come to the king, and they say, this is what we want you to do. We want you to um, allow the Jews, send out a proclamation, because you can't undo the first one, saying that the Jews are allowed to defend themselves, and, and whoever comes against them, if they defeat them, they can take their spoils, their stuff for spoils. Okay? And so word goes throughout the kingdom, because now all of a sudden Mordecai is exalted into Haman's place. 
And all the people in the kingdom are going, oh, wait a minute. You know, the last decree we got, things were good. We're going to wipe them out. We're going to get their stuff. But now they get to fight back and they can possibly take our stuff. And one of their guys is second in the kingdom. This is not going good for us. Okay? And sure enough, it didn't go good. Uh, we find out on the first day, on the uh, 13th, um, the Jews fought back so well that they defeated everybody that came against them. We know that they killed the ten sons of Haman. Uh, on uh, the evening of that day, uh, the king asks Esther if he can do anything else for her. She says, yeah, let the people of Susa have one more day and, and let them hang the ten children of Haman from the same gallows. And he said, okay, do it. Now, that, that takes a tough woman. Okay. And so they have a second day. Now, what's interesting is that the scripture says that the Jews didn't actually take the spoils. Okay. They simply defended themselves. So Mordecai and Esther... They write a decree to all of the Jews saying that on the 14th of Adar, the Jews are to celebrate the Feast of Purim. And the Feast of Purim is because of the poor that was cast. And they're to celebrate it, and they're, they're to celebrate it for two days. Because of the two days, the first day, the 13th, and the second day, the 14th. And it goes throughout the entire kingdom, and they're to celebrate to remember how God had delivered them and God had saved his people. Now, let's connect the dots. You have King Saul, who was given a task to do by God via Samuel, and he didn't carry it all the way through, did he? And of, the, um, of his descendants, or of his family, coming out from his family, we have Mordecai, who is connected some way back to Kish. Okay? And then the people that, that, that Saul was supposed to wipe out, Agag was the king, and somehow connected to him going down through the lines, comes Haman. God leaves his words <coughs> fulfilled. There, nothing in here is in here on accident. When God gave us their genealogy, it wasn't so we could go, <sighs> skip, okay? He gave us the genealogy so we could connect the dots and bring it back to what God said in Exodus, what God did through Saul and Samuel in, in uh, 1 Samuel, and he's bringing it to completion in Esther. Now, we're looking at a period of more than 800 years from point A to point C, and God fulfilled his promise and he wiped out the last of the Amalekites. We never hear about any other Amalekites after that. Okay? So, what does this mean to us? Not much. Not really very much. As a matter of fact, the Jews, most of the Jews today don't celebrate Purim. Purim. Um, they, uh, um, most of the ones that do, do so for the kids. Um, they celebrate with costumes and plays and parades. Um, the uh, central to the feast is the reading of the book of Esther, and they have this tradition that whenever you read the book of Esther and Haman's name is read, right before they start uh, to read his name, you're supposed to shout and clap and stomp your feet and boo and hiss and when, crank up these noisemakers because they want to literally fulfill that, that they would, uh, their name would be blotted out from under the heavens. Okay, And so one of the other things that comes out of it is they drink. Now, in the rabbinic writings, they said that the celebration would be such that the people could not discern between the cursing of Haman and the blessing of Mordecai. Well, part of the celebration was drinking, so the Jews took that to mean we got to get slobbery drunk. And so the, a lot of Jews will imbibe freely and, and get drunk. Um, I don't think that's what the, the rabbis were intending, but um, that's how it was interpreted, and, and that's what they do. So um, what does this mean to us? Really, it's... There's, there's not really any messianic implication other than the Jews believe that after the Messiah comes and he sets things aright and he puts them back into the predominance as, as the, the greatest nation on the earth because he's their king, they will still celebrate Purim. Um, the Jews look at the Amalekites with the same eyes at, at that time, with the same eyes that we look at the Nazis, okay, or Al-Qaeda. Uh, specifically to the Jewish people, they, the Amalekites and Agag especially, represent all of the people that despise Israel and want to wipe them from the face of the earth. So we can look at that and make a correlation to today with World War II and, and with Iran and, and, and Syria and Gaza and, and all the things, all the people that are, are wanting to wipe Israel out again, that they fall under that same thing. And so the thinking is when the Messiah comes back, they will continue to celebrate this because it's going to be the completion of what God had promised and that all of their enemies will be wiped out, they will be no more, and it will be a celebration of the, of the completion of what God has done for them as a nation. Okay, so what does that mean for us as, as Christians? 
get ready to celebrate Purim, I guess. Because there's no other place in Scripture that it's talked about. It doesn't say whether Jesus celebrated or not. I'm guessing that he probably did, just because in the second uh, temple period, that was very common. But um, it was not one of the big ones. We know he celebrated the Feast of Lights. It tells us that he was in the temple grounds during the Feast of Lights. But it doesn't say anything about Purim. So it's the last of the, the feasts that we know of in Scripture. It's not a prophetic feast as far as we know. Okay, as far as we understand what went on, um, other than it might be a type of, of what God did to save Israel under the Persians and what he will do when he brings all things to an end. But, I mean, that's speculation. So we really don't know. So we end with Purim. I, I have my glasses off and I can't see the time. Okay. Okay. I started to panic because, you know, you people won't say anything. Um... So, the feasts. We started off with the Sabbath, Leviticus 23. God declares the Sabbath as the first feast. It's to be done every week. There is to be no ordinary work done. Uh, they are to remember that on the seventh day God rested, the seventh day being what? Of the week. Saturday, Saturday. We understand from the New Testament that all days are equal. We understand that Jesus gave us a radically different understanding of what celebrating the Sabbath meant than what the Jews had made it. Uh, he's, he took that phrase uh, that man was made for the Sabbath. He said, no, no, a Sabbath was made for man. It was to benefit man and bless man, not for man to bless it. Okay? So um, we understand that we can worship on any day. As a matter of fact, when the, first, the church was first established, they worshiped every day. Okay? We come together on the first day of the week. Um, some people say, oh, no, you can't do that. It's got to be the last day. It's got to be Saturday. Uh, Paul makes it very clear in Colossians. It doesn't matter which day we celebrate, so long as we celebrate unto God. Okay? So then we move into the Feast of Passover, Pesach. Um, this is the, the, we believe that all of these feasts are a foreshadow of what's to come, a prophetic undertaking. The Sabbath, there is a Sabbath rest that is coming for us. When, when God makes all things right, we will enter into a Sabbath rest. We see that Jesus fulfilled Passover by becoming the Paschal Lamb. We see that he came into Jerusalem on, on uh, Good Friday. He was being celebrated. He was being wooed. That was Lamb Selection Day. He was being presented to the people in the temple. They got to question him. They got to look at him. They got to prove that he was without blemish. That was done because nobody, nobody could bring accusation against him that he couldn't refute and set right, okay? So he was examined over those days, and then at the Passover, he was sacrificed at the time of the Paschal Lamb sacrifice. Um, we, we know that he fulfilled the, the covering of our sins, okay? Then we have the, the Feast of First Fruits that immediately follows, oh, I'm sorry, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the week following Passover. Uh, we see that Jesus fulfilled that, and that leaven represents sin, and Jesus was a sinless sacrifice, the unleavened bread. He fulfilled both of those with his death, his life and his death. <coughs> then we have the Feast of First Fruits. Paul makes it very clear that he sees, he believes that Jesus fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits by being the firstborn from the dead, never to die again. That's the Feast of First Fruits. And where he is gone, we will go. As he was resurrected, we will be resurrected. Uh, and then we have the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot. Uh, Shavuot is seven sevens, Pentecost is 50. Uh, we see in Leviticus 23 that there are seven weeks of seven days, and then on the next day, the 50th day, you celebrate Pentecost. This is the latter first fruits, okay? Um, we see that this was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the church was born, was birthed. Now, I believe that Leviticus 23 is a prophetic chiasm. Um, chiasm is you start with point A, you move to point B, you move to point C and point D, and then you reverse course and go back to C, B, and A. I, I believe that this is a prophetic chiasm of sorts because right after Pentecost, um, Leviticus 23 tells us that we move into the season of harvest, the summer season. And then there's three months where nothing happens because you're gathering in the harvest. Okay, then the fall feasts come upon us, and we have the first, the Feast of Trumpets. The trumpet blows, and, and uh, we know 
that scripture says that when Jesus comes back for his people, it will be with a loud trumpet blast. We believe, I believe, I don't know what you believe, I'm just lumping you with me. We're all in this together. You all think what I think, all right? No, I believe that when that trumpet blast goes, that's gonna be the first step in reversing course because when God gave the promise, he gave it to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Okay, God is going to take out of this earth his church, his bride, and then his focus is going to shift back to the Israelites. Okay, now we're in that summer period, which is called the age of the church, the dispensation of grace, the age of the church. That's going to end when God takes the bride of Christ out. Okay, that's the Feast of Trumpets. Then we have the Feast of Atonement. I believe that the Feast of Atonement is specifically, because the church is gone, this is specifically for the people of Israel. We look at the prophecies concerning them. The nations are going to come against them. The majority of them are going to be slaughtered. There's going to be a remnant left, and when that remnant is left, they are going to call out to God. And Jesus will set foot on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount will be split, and he will fulfill the promises that are left unfulfilled up to that, that point. Okay? And Israel will be saved. Okay. Then finally, we end with the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, this was where um, they would get in booths during the week. They would celebrate. Uh, it was a joyous time. They were commanded to, to be joyful. Um, there was a lot of, of goings on for the week. There was an added eighth day to, to kind of wrap things up. I believe the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is in... Uh, the last two chapters of Revelation because it tells us that we will see the new Jerusalem descending down on the new earth and then it tells us that uh, the voice from heaven says behold the tabernacle of God is with man and I think that's going to be a fulfillment that's going to be better than anything that's ever happened before because you think in the garden the presence of God came in the evening and walked with them in the cool of the evening but the, the presence of God did not live with them he, he didn't live with them, he didn't dwell with them we look at the institution of the tabernacle and the presence of God, manifest presence of God being above the mercy seat, okay? But he was separated from everybody by the, the veil and, and only one person one time a year could go before him and, and he had to do sacrifice before to make himself pure before he could go in to make sacrifice, okay? And, and then, but, but the presence of God was not with the people. It was in the tabernacle and later the temple and, and it was, there was no way to get there. Okay? But in Revelation, it says that the dwelling place of God will be with man. We will have the manifest presence of God with us. It's something that has never been done before. Okay? Uh, as far as Hanukkah, we talked about the, the festival of life. We talked about the fulfillment of, of promises in the intertestamental period. We talked about Purim. Uh, and and, and you know, I, I really don't know how that's going to be prophetically fulfilled. If it is, maybe it's just history and there is no prophecy for it. I don't know. There's a lot of things that I read in the New Testament and they say that fulfilled this prophecy. When I read it in the Old Testament, I had no clue it was prophecy. Mm -hmm. you know, and I look back and I go, huh, I missed that. Okay? So, there's the feasts. There's the wrap-up. We're done with the feasts.